Hello everybody and welcome to another YouTube video. So in today's video, I'm going to be showing you some weird Python code. I've got a bunch of code snippets to show you. All of this code is just strange, weird stuff in Python. And you can kind of treat this video like a quiz or test for yourself where you try to guess what the output of this code is or figure out what it is before I actually run it. Now, before we dive in, I do need to mention that the sponsor of this video, which is Fast Host, is running a competition for any of my UK based viewers. So if you are based in the UK and you can answer my techie test question, then you'll be entered to win your dream work from home setup, which is worth up to five thousand pounds. So stay tuned for that and let's dive into the video. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. Now, the first weird things I have to show you in Python are kind of Easter eggs and they involve importing modules. So these are super simple. But the first thing you can do that is quite weird in Python is import the this module. If you import this and you run your script, what this actually does is outputs a poem. This poem is the Zen of Python by Tim Peters. Now, I'm not going to read it. You guys can read it yourself. But this is kind of an interesting poem. And well, if you're into Python and you write a lot in Python, you'll probably appreciate some of the stuff that's in here. So the next weird thing I have to show you in Python is also a very simple Easter egg. This one involves importing the anti gravity module. And when you do this, you import this module It actually opens up a new Chrome tab or new, I guess, web browser tab that has a comic which is about Python. So I mean, you guys can look at the comic yourself. I'm not going to go through all of it, but another interesting Easter egg and well, a weird thing you can do in Python. So the next piece of weird Python code I need to show you involves the walrus operator. Now, the walrus operator is the colon and the equal sign, formerly known as the assignment expression operator. It's used in a few other programming languages, but it was actually new in Python in version 3.8. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you how this operator works, then I'll show you kind of a weird nuance with this operator that you might not know about. OK, so that is the walrus operator. What's the point of the walrus operator? Well, we have some function here. This function takes in X, does some long computation and then returns X plus one. So imagine this function maybe takes a few seconds to run. It's not very efficient. And well, we shouldn't call it unnecessarily if we don't have to. So the problem that I present to you is we need to check the value of this function call. So let's say I have some variable or let's have some if statement. And I say if the func of maybe four is equal to let's just go with five. Then what I want to do is I want to actually print what the value of func of four is. Or maybe just to make this easier, we'll go if this is greater than or equal to five. So the whole point is we're calling this function with the value four, and we actually want to use whatever the result of that function call was inside of this block. But this is pretty inefficient. I don't want to call this function two times if I don't have to. And well, both of these function calls are going to give me the exact same thing. I shouldn't do this. Instead, I should store this value somewhere and then use it. Right. So what I could do if I didn't know about the walrus operator is I could do something like x equals func of four. I could then say if x is greater than five, and then I could just print X like that. And well, that would solve my problems. However, there is a cleaner way to do this, and this involves the walrus operator. So what I can actually do is inside of parentheses, I can say if X colon equals using the walrus operator, the func of and then four is greater than or equal to five print X. And what this will do is actually evaluate this. So we'll say X is equal to the func of four, and then it will take whatever the value of X is and kind of plug it in here for the parentheses and check if that is greater than or equal to five. So if I run this, we see that we print out five, which is the value of X. So that is how the assignment expression operator works. Now, one small detail here. If you use the walrus operator like this, you would imagine that what's going to happen is that X is still going to be equal to func four, right? And then you're going to check if whatever the return value of this in, in this case is going to be five is greater than or equal to five. And then you're going to print out X. That's what you would imagine. You would imagine that X is going to be equal to whatever the function call is. However, if I do this, notice we actually print out true. Now, that's kind of strange. Why is that the case? Well, the reason that's the case is because what we actually did here is we assigned X equal to this expression. And that is because the precedence of this operator comes after this operator right here. So that is why we're getting the value true. We're first checking if the func of four is greater than or equal to five. That gives us true. And then we're assigning that value to X. So kind of a weird thing with the walrus operator. Now, another thing that's weird about the walrus operator is you can't do something like this x colon equals and then the func of two. 
if you try to do this, you get an error. And the reason you get an error is because this is not inside of parentheses and because it's not used inside of like an if statement, a for loop, whatever. It's not used in kind of the intended way. You can't just blankly assign something like this. Now, of course, x equals func of two works. But what's even weirder is that if you surround this with parentheses, all of a sudden you're good. I can just print out x. I'm going to get rid of this right here and everything is fine. It all works. So the fact that you didn't have parentheses around this made it no longer work. So kind of just a weird thing with the walrus operator. That's pretty much all I needed to show you. So the next piece of weird Python code I have for you is in front of me right here. And before I discuss anything, pause the video if you'd like and guess what the output of this program is going to be. Now, if you're still listening and you're a little bit confused, but you want to try to guess it, my hint is going to be this has to do with the mutability of objects. So just take a look and guess what you think this is. Now, first, let me explain what the is keyword does in case anyone's a little bit confused. So is is not the same as equals equals. What equals equals does is compare the equivalence of objects. So a really good example of this is if I have D and E and I make this equal to an empty list and an empty list. Let me just remove this here. If I print D is equal to E, we see that these are the same. These are equivalent, right? An empty list is equal to an empty list. However, D is not E because these are not the exact same empty list. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. But this empty list is stored in a different memory location than this empty list. And what D is E actually does is it checks the equivalence of the IDs of these objects. So every object in Python has an ID. That is the address of the memory location this object stored in. And what we can see D and E are in two different memory address locations. So when we say is something the same, are these two objects the same? We're not checking uh, equivalence. We're checking if they actually are the exact same object stored in the same location in memory. OK, so let's go back uh, to the example that we had. So print A is B, A is C and B is C. Now, the first thing I'll show you is that all of these strings are the exact same, right? A, B and C are the same. And if I print them, we get OK, 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 perfect. So when I do this, we have to kind of guess what we think these should be. But all of them should be the exact same, right? Because they're the same string. So these should all give us the same result. If A is B, then A should be C and B should be C. If A is not B, then A should not be C and B should not be C, right? That's what we would assume. But the thing is, when I print this, that's not the case. We get false, false and true. Now, what we actually would expect with kind of some basic knowledge of Python and memory addresses and how objects are created is that A should not be B and B should not be C and A should not be C. These should all be different objects. And the reason for that is strings in Python are immutable. And when you create an immutable object, what it does is create a new object in memory, right? And that's all it does. So we technically should have A being a different ID than B being a different ID than C. But in this case, A is different than B, A is different than C, but B is the same as C. How is this the case? So B and C are the exact same object, but A is a different object somehow. Well, the reason for this is something called interning. Now, interning is an optimization that's performed by the Cthon compiler, interpreter, whatever it exactly is. I don't know all of the details behind this. But what it does is it reads your code before it's ran. So while it's being kind of compiled into bytecode for the computer to understand, and it performs optimizations. And one of the optimizations it does is it sees if there's any objects that are the exact same. And if they're the exact same and they're immutable objects, it creates one of those objects and points the variables to that singular object. So in this case, OK and OK were in turned and said, OK, <laughs> no pun intended there. We see that we've created OK two times. So rather than duplicating it and creating it twice in memory, let's make it once and let's have these variables point to that one object. That's what it does. That's what the interning is doing. However, why is it not doing it for variable A? The reason it's not doing it for variable A is because when the optimizations are performed, the compiler does not know that this object is going to be equivalent to OK. It doesn't know that's what the string is going to be equal to. And the reason for that is we're using the dot join method. And the dot join method is actually interpreted and ran at runtime, not at compile time. Whereas a basic string concatenation and just the definition of a variable like this, we know what these are going to be before the program actually runs. And that's why the optimization can be performed. Hopefully that makes sense. But that is why you get this strange output. And 
That's just one of the weird things that can go on in Python. You're going to see many more as we continue in this video. So we'll get into the rest of the weird code in just a minute, but I need to remind you that the sponsor of this video, which is FastHost, is hosting a competition that you can enter. Now, FastHost is a UK-based web hosting company that offers a wide range of products and services. They aim to help businesses and entrepreneurs of all levels succeed with effective, fast, and affordable web hosting that fits really any use case. FastHost's affordable virtual private servers give you complete control over your server. With flexible, dedicated resources, you can adjust your server's RAM, CPU, and storage whenever you need. Other features include 100% SSD storage, UK data centers, and your choice of operating systems for both Linux or Windows. FastHost also offers outstanding dedicated servers that are exclusively yours. You can choose between the latest AMD and Intel hardware that guarantees high performance, which is perfect for demanding projects. With secure UK data centers, unlimited bandwidth, top-of-the-line specs, and 24-7 support, you can be confident that your projects can handle anything they need to. So now I need to discuss the competition. If you're located in the UK and you can answer the following question, then you'll be entered to win your dream work from home setup that's worth up to 5,000 pounds. Now that question is, who invented the Python programming language? Leave your answers at the link in the description and best of luck in the competition. So the next piece of weird Python code I have for you is in front of me here. Take a second, pause the video and take a guess at what you think this is going to output. Now, this weird Python code here has to do with chained operations. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because sometimes it's a little bit tricky to actually realize what the result of these expressions are going to be. So let's just have a look at this first print statement right here. And actually, I'll just run all of these and you can kind of see what our result is. So true, true, false, false. So let's look at this first expression. So one equals equals one. We need to evaluate this first because it's in parentheses. And we see when we evaluate this, that's going to give us true. So we have true in one. Now, many of you may have thought this is actually going to give us false because, well, there's no true inside of this list. But the thing is, one and true in Python are actually pretty much the same thing. They're equivalent. And to show this to you, if I print true equals equals one, you see that we get to true. And I mean, up here as well, we got true. And another cool thing you can do is you can actually print true plus one. And that's going to give you two because true is really just one. And so that's why that first expression does actually evaluate to true. OK, so now that you know that the rest of these are going to be a little bit easier, but let's keep going. We have one equals equals and then one in one. Again, pretty straightforward. We know one in one is going to be true. One is equal to one. And so that prints true. OK, what about this expression right here? We have one is less than and then zero less than one. So is zero less than one? No, it's not. Or sorry. Yes, it is. Zero is less than one. And so that gives us true. So now we're checking if one is less than true. We know true is one. And so in this case, we're going to get false. That's why it's printing out false there. OK, that's what that's that one. Sorry. Now let's have a look at this one. One less than zero, less than one. All right. So again, this one's pretty straightforward because we now know that one is equal to true. But we start when we don't have any parentheses here by evaluating from left to right since these are the same operator. So one is less than uh, zero. That is false. So now we get false less than one. And you would imagine that false less than one is going to give us true, right? This is kind of a tricky one because one less than zero, that's false. So you would imagine we're going to have false less than one. So false less than one, well, that should be true because false would be equal to zero. And just to show you, if I print false plus one, you're going to see that we get one there, right? Because false is equal to zero. But again, we're seeing here that when I go back to this expression, we're getting false. Why is that the case? Well, when you write this expression in Python, it's not evaluated in the way that you think it should be. What you actually get here when you write this is one less than zero and like this, zero less than one. This is what the actual expression is. And so that is why we end up getting false because one is not less than zero. So that's a false and that causes this whole expression to be false. So that's kind of the trick and the weird thing here is that when you write an expression like this that's chained with these operators, you have to imagine that you're going to have this expression and this expression. It doesn't evaluate this first and then use this to evaluate against this. But in this situation, it does because you have the parentheses. So that's kind of the weird code in this example. So the next weird piece of Python code is in front of me here. Take a second, pause the video and have a guess at what you think the output is going to be. Now, this code here has to do with dictionaries. 
So I've created a dictionary and then I'm adding three keys into the dictionary and three values. So looking at this on a very surface level, you would imagine we're going to have three keys in the dictionary and there's going to be three values for these keys, right? Hi, hello and yo. However, when I print this, notice that we only get one key and this is equal to yo. Now, if you're just looking at D1 and D2 minus one, you notice immediately that these are the exact same, right? We have one and then we have one, two minus one is one. And so it kind of makes sense that we're overriding the high key with yo. However, what about the 1.0? Why is it that I don't get a 1.0 key inside of my dictionary? And just to show you how weird this actually is, if I comment these two out and I run this, we do get the 1.0 key. So why is this the case? Well, the reason this is the case is because what actually happens when you're using a dictionary is the key value here gets hashed. And by hashing this key value, you can actually achieve constant lookup and constant deletion and insertion of keys. I won't really get into that too much, but pretty much any equivalent keys in Python will hash to the exact same value. It's a little bit strange, but what actually happens when you use the dictionary, as I was saying, is the key value gets sent to a hash function. And that hash function is kind of the actual key that's associated with a value. So if I do something like uh, we can say X is equal to the hash of one and Y is equal to the hash of two minus one. And then I print out X equals equals Y. You're going to see that these are the same thing. And then same if I do this hash of 1.0, these are the same thing. So equivalent values in Python hash to the exact same thing. And even more strange, if I do the hash of true, that also hashes to the same thing. So you have to be careful in dictionaries because if you have keys that are equivalent but do not look the exact same like true and like one, their hash is going to go to the same thing, which means if you're trying to have two distinct keys, but they're equivalent, that's not possible. You're going to end up overriding one of those keys. Hopefully that kind of makes sense, but that explains why when we have one and 1.0, we end up overriding the key, right? So if I just do this, and I just have one and 1.0. You see that we get the key one with hello and notice it's not 1.0. Strange again, right? So we initially added one as the key. So we hashed one and then added that as the key. And then we said D at 1.0 is equal to hello. And when we hashed 1.0, we realized this key already existed in the dictionary. So rather than creating a new key, we overwrote it with hello. And that's why one still exists, even though the value is associated with the key at 1.0. So really weird how this works. And if we do this in reverse, you'll get the same thing, right? So if I have D at 1.0, 1.0 is the key that persists because it was the first one that was added in. So that's all I needed to show you. Just some weird things related to hashing of keys with dictionaries in Python. The next weird Python code I have for you has to do with the all function. So there's this function in Python called all. And what this does is take some iterable object and tell you if all of the values in it are equal to true. So if I go one, two, three, false and then let's print out all and let's see what we get. We get false. The reason we get false is because there was one false in this list. Now, if I remove the false, we get true because all three of these values are true values. OK, now clearly, if you go true, true, this is going to give you true. And well, all works, right? No pun intended again, but it works as we would expect. Now, the weird thing occurs, though, when you start having nested lists. So let's say I have a nested list. So just an empty list inside of this list right here. When I run this, notice that we get false. But what happens if I add something inside of this empty list? Well, when I do this, we get true. So it's kind of weird how this works. If I add another nested list, now we get false. So the nested list, an empty list is equal to false. So if you have an empty list, inside of the list, then that's false. However, this is where it gets really weird. If you have an empty list inside of an empty list inside of an empty list, this gives you true. And the reason for that is that the way that the all function is implemented is as follows. I'm just going to copy it in here. We have define all iterable for element interval, if not element return false, otherwise return true. And so when you have three nested lists like this and we check the element that's inside of the main list, which is this element right here, we see that it's not empty. This list here, the one that's kind of like the second embedded is not empty because it has an empty list inside of it. And so that means that this actually tells us that, oh, yeah, this is true. Even though we know there's no true values in here, it's completely empty. It's just a bunch of nested lists. So a very weird thing. 
obviously I could add a bunch more nested lists like this. We still get true. I could add even more nested lists inside of the nested lists and well, we're all good. So just kind of a weird thing. Figured I would show that to you when you have two nested lists, you get false when you have three you get true and that's because of the implementation here of the all function. All right, so the next weird Python code I have is right here. Pause the video, take a guess at what you think the output is going to be. All right, so let's run through this here. We have our first print statement. We have x equals true, y equals false. We say not x equals equals y. Now you have to ask yourself here when you're evaluating these, is the not gonna be applied on the x or is the not gonna be applied on the x equals equals y? Good question to ask. You have to ask yourself that. I imagine most of you would assume that the not is going to be applied on the X, right? So if you're taking that logic, you're saying, okay, not X. So not true, not true is false. False does equal false. And so this first print statement should give us the value true. So if I output this, we do get true. Nice. Okay. So now let's move to the next print statement. So we'll follow the exact same logic as before. We'll say, all right, we're going to apply the not to the Y first. So that means not Y is going to be true x is equal to uh, true. So that should give us true, right? Our second print statement should output true. So let's run it and notice we get an error. It says invalid syntax x equals equals not y. So why is this the case? Why are we getting an error here? Well, the reason we're getting an error here is that not actually has a lower precedent than equals equals. So we actually apply the equals equals before we apply the not. And so in this situation, what this expression actually looks like is not x equals equals y. So in this case, we thought that we were doing it correctly just because those expressions are the same uh, when you do them in the opposite order, but not is evaluated after uh, the equals equals. So even though the not doesn't work the way we thought it does, we still get the right answer here because, well, the not of false is equal to true. But when we go down here, the reason we get the syntax error is because we try to evaluate the equals equals before we evaluate the not. And so what happens is we say x equals equals not. That's what we look at. The expression right here is what's being looked at first, and that's what's throwing that syntax error because not is obviously not valid. I, I can't compare not to X, and so that's why we're getting an error. So if I wanted this to work properly, I would need to actually do this. So now if I do this, we're going to evaluate the parentheses first, which is good. That turns that false into a true, and then X equals equals true. Well, of course, that is true. So it's kind of a weird thing. You would think you could do something like this, but you do need to parenthesize it because if you do this on the right hand side of a double equals sign, then you're actually going to get a syntax error, which is not something that most people expect. All right. So the last one I have for you here is definitely the trickiest. Don't feel bad if you don't get it correct. In fact, I'll be surprised if any of you get this correct, but pause the video, take a guess if you want. And now I will explain it. Okay, so we have a comma b equals a and then this at index b equal to dictionary comma five. At first glance, this is very confusing, and you're probably thinking this is going to result in an error. I'll tell you right now, it's not an error. Now, the reason you might think it's an error is because we have two values here, two values here, but only one value here. And you would kind of imagine that what's going to happen is if I put like a C here, so maybe I did like DC, is that A is going to be equal to dictionary, D is going to be equal to dictionary, B will be equal to five, and C will be equal to five. That would be a good guess to have if we had two, two, and two, but we don't. We have two, one, and two. So how does that change things? Well, let me just run this and show you what we get. We get a dictionary for A with a key five that has the value, which is equal to a tuple that has the same dictionary. This is what's known as a circular reference, and then the value five. Now, let me explain the circular reference. So whenever you see three dots inside of a data structure, that means that this data structure here is the exact same as the data structure it's inside of. And so what really is happening here is five is holding a tuple and inside of that tuple, it's holding this entire dictionary. And so rather than printing the entire dictionary again, it prints three dots because if it were to print the entire dictionary again, it would do that into infinity because if it prints the dictionary and the dictionary is itself, then that dictionary is going to need to print itself again and again, and again, and again, and you would just recursively keep printing the same dictionary. And hence why you get the three dots, because this is a circular reference. This dictionary is actually the exact same dictionary here. Kind of a weird thing, but that's what it is. So let's kind of diagnose this and see how we actually come up with this. So what actually happens here when you have an expression or you have kind of like multiple equal signs on the same line is you start by assigning the values on the furthest left first. And what you do is you say a 
is equal to, or a comma b is equal to, and then whatever's on the furthest right hand side. And so in this case, a becomes equal to a dictionary and b becomes equal to five. That's the first assignment. So let's write this down. A is dictionary, b is five. So this kind of first left assignment is done. Now we read this. We say a b is equal to dictionary and five. The thing is, this dictionary has already been assigned to A. And so this dictionary here is the same as the dictionary stored in A. It's not a new dictionary because we only wrote it once. So now what happens is we say A at key B is equal to dictionary comma five. Now B exists because we just assigned B. And so what this does is it adds the key five to the dictionary and the key five now stores the tuple, which holds the dictionary and five. But this dictionary is the same dictionary that A is holding. And so what this ends up holding is five colon and then dictionary, which has five colon and so on and so forth. So what you end up getting is that circular reference, right? And so I'll just kind of write it in as the dot 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 to save us from the confusion. But this is what you get. And that's why you get it, because that's the way that you read it. And so kind of a strange, weird thing. I've never seen anything like this in Python before, but I figured I would show it to you as the last thing because, well, it's very, very weird. All right. So with that said, I think I'm going to end the video here. Now, all of the examples that I showed you here are actually from a GitHub repository. It's called WTF Python. I'll leave the link in the description. Full credit to them. They have a ton of other examples on there. I just kind of went through and picked ones that I think would be good to show in a video. But if you want to see way more advanced ones, check out that repository in the link in the description. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I will see you in another one.